Well, Dr. Ayer, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited for this conversation because I don't often get the chance to talk to an actual doctor and um, really ask the, the hard questions. Um, there, there's a lot of, you know, over the 26 years that I've been sober, there is, I've heard a lot of people share their stories about things, advice that they've gotten from doctors who are not trained in addiction special, like they, they don't have that addiction specialist component like you do. And, um, you know, people who, you know, they share with their doctors, I, you know, oh, I'm in recovery, you know, even they're going to have a surgery or they're experiencing something, the doctor will prescribe like highly addictive medications. And I'm always really concerned about that. And at the same time I go, well, I'm not a doctor, so who am I to argue? But I've seen some detrimental outcomes. And so um, I'm so glad you're willing to come on and talk about maybe how you see the field as a whole and help people who are trying to recover. Um, I think one of the most important things to know as somebody in recovery is when am I doing practicing drug seeking behavior mm -hmm. or when do I really need help? You know, so um, we had on our agenda today to talk about addiction in general, um, the process of detox, and even right. uh, I think you mentioned medicated assisted treatment. So That's correct, totally I right. am fascinated by all that, but maybe you can just take a few minutes to talk a little bit about who you are, um, where you've spent your time studying, and uh, what you're doing now. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much, Alina. I appreciate it. Uh you inviting me uh, over. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, a really short story just as a, as a backdrop. Um, a few years ago, uh, when I was doing my uh, residency and fellowship training, I, I had the opportunity to work in an um, inpatient behavioral unit for kids, uh, many of whom had been uh, um, uh, victims of severe trauma. So uh, we're acting out with various behavioral issues. And I, I remember talking to uh, an 80 year old uh, on this day. And after my discussion with him, just as he walked out of the, uh, the interview room uh, with me, there was a group of other eight, nine year olds out there. And, you know, they got to ask him how the conversation with me went. And I recall him saying, well, the interview was nice. And, you know, we talked a lot about my past and things that have been going on but you know he he sounds different i don't know where he's from and um i recall one of the kids um uh, in the group saying well he's from mexico and then um another kid said no 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 he's from france and then yet another kid said no i, I think he's from iceland and that that really threw me off and i had such a good laugh in the room at the time and much later on I talked to the kid who had said I was from Iceland and I was curious for an eight year old. I mean, how did he even know there was a country like Iceland? And he said, well, you know, a friend of his had, uh, had talked about it the previous day and he just wanted to show off to his friends that he knew there was a place like Iceland. So, you know, never a dull moment with kids. But no, I'm not from Mexico, France or Iceland. I'm from Nigeria. That's where I was born and bred and did my net schooling and uh, moved down after graduating as a physician to uh, the United Kingdom, England, uh, where I did my psychiatry uh, residency training and uh, obtained my uh, membership with the Royal College of Psychiatrists uh, in England and then moved down to the United States in 2008. Um, schooled in the University of Missouri where I did um, uh, my residency training and then proceeded to do a fellowship in um, child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, afterwards, I pursued a board certification in um, addiction medicine as well, and also uh, lifestyle medicine. And, you know, for me, the reasons why I went ahead to obtain these qualifications really is just to make myself as well-rounded as possible to be able to offer uh, the best help to, uh, to the patients I, I treat. That's amazing. I mean, your resume is so intense. That is a lot of school. <laughs> Well, it, it, it has been a lot of schooling, but the good thing is it's exciting. And yeah. also when you see the benefits you can offer to people who are struggling, I think, I think that's priceless. You know, for me, I've always seen addiction as 
um, intriguing as a field. And, you know, of course, as we know, there's also the stigma that comes not just with mental health, but with, with addiction as well. And yeah. uh, obviously, there's no objective way to measure it, but I'm, I'm sure we can easily say the stigma that comes with addiction is probably two, three, four times more than what you even experience with mental health. So seeing patients struggle with that stigma and just try as much as they can to get to recovery has been for me one of the uh, motivating factors in terms of just um, becoming more knowledgeable in treating people with addiction. And of course, it's also the transformation, right? Mm -hmm. um, you see people who just struggle and have lost their everything and are at a point in their lives where there's just a lot of hopelessness. And being a part of a team where you can, in your own little way, contribute to helping them pick up the pieces and get their lives back, I think it's just second to none. I think, I think that's absolutely priceless. And I mean, over the course, over the span of my career, there are tons of stories. And one which comes to mind um, right now is um, a 34-year-old man whom I'd seen several years ago. This is a man who had a history of um, alcohol use disorder and had just really struggled with life, had lost his job, lost his wife, multiple DUIs, so had legal issues also had developed liver cirrhosis, which is a complication of long-term use, which can be a complication of long-term use of alcohol. And I recall seeing him in the ER when he came in after overdosing on medications and alcohol, because he was just so hopeless and frustrated with his life and felt the only way out was to kill himself. And, you know, at the time, I remember talking to him, and I remember this patient vividly because he was... 34 years old at the time, and I was also 34 years old at the time. Um, in addition to that, he had a three-year-old son who had just turned three years a year prior to when I met him for the, uh, for the first time. I also had a three-year-old son. Um, now, my son is 13 years old, and his son would have been 13 years old as well, but his son died in a motor vehicle accident just a month after his birthday. Mm -hmm. Now this patient was driving, intoxicated, mm -hmm. on alcohol and benzodiazepines. So this was a man who was broken and just completely shattered. And yes, he's been able to pick his life back and together as a team, we're able to help him get to the point where He's now more functional as of the last time I met with him. He had a job, he had gotten back with his wife as well. But things like that leave a huge scar for you know, any, anybody. So it's stories like this and multiple other stories as well, which I've experienced with people that has really motivated me and pushed me to get into this amazing field of addiction to hopefully help even a lot more people than, than I have in the past. That is absolutely, I mean, I'm like, oh, don't cry, I try to act professional. I mean, that is, I mean, that, the, I've, I've heard those stories, that is probably one of the worst stories. I can't imagine, I have kids, and so I cannot imagine what it would have been like to lose a child, but for you as somebody who's a professional, that must that must, I mean, it sounds like you related to him so much. How do you maintain, are you able to maintain like, a, I'm sure you have to maintain a level of um, like objective distance in a way so that you can continue to, to, to help people. I mean, I know the transformations are amazing to witness, but those, those tragedies have to, does that take a toll on you at all? Well, I, you know, like you talked about earlier on, it's been a lot of schooling, right? And, you know, in addition to the knowledge base that comes with all the schooling also comes, you know, um, ways of being able to help ourselves proceed as well, because we see and hear a lot of uh, such uh, stories and we have to be able to place ourselves in uh, a good frame of mind and mindset to be able to continue to help people. So again, self-care comes in. So as much as, you know, I talk to uh, patients about self-care, also make sure I practice self-care myself because I have to be in the right space to continue to help people. Um, which brings me to one of, uh, it brings me to, you know, the lifestyle medicine component. Uh, so that's something I've always been interested in, just living healthier, exercising, working out, um, you know, better nutrition. So with the knowledge I have, I'm able to 
help out a lot of patients, but I don't take that lightly at all. I also apply that to myself because I know the only way I can keep going is to make sure I'm also taking care of myself to be able to take care of others. Now that's really big. I always say you can't, you're not going to be able to drive far in a car without any gas. And that's correct. <laughs> you know, people like us are, we're driving pretty hard and going pretty far. We got a lot, a lot going on. So self-care is, um, that's really key. So let's, maybe we should start at the beginning. Like what in your mind, like how do you view addiction um, in general? Well, you know, I, I find addiction um, as a subject quite fascinating. Um, I still see it as a fairly um, new area in the sense that there's still a ton of research and a lot we still need to know uh, in terms of um, what causes addiction and how to proceed with treating people with addictions and what medications and other modalities of treatment we can use. Um, as we know, addiction basically manifests itself as you know, the compulsive use of uh, substances or even behaviors uh, despite uh, the negative uh, consequences or the harmful consequences uh, that come with it. And, um, at the center of this, right, is the brain. And, you know, the brain is the most complex organ of the body. So your brain essentially is you. And the brain contains billions of neurons, you know, which communicate with themselves and help us perceive the environment, uh, uh, you know, one way or the other via various uh, senses. So the way I like to look at it is uh, various switches within the brain communicating with themselves, uh, firing impulses and messages from one side to another. And in the middle of all of this, you have the so-called brain chemicals of which they're many. Now, when it comes to addiction, right, we, we're, we're looking predominantly as dopamine as the center. And I like to look at dopamine as uh, the safe button of the brain. So, you know, you if you look at experiences in life, let's say you go out there and you have a nice piece of red velvet cake, for instance, you know, you have a little release of dopamine and the brain saves that. And next time the brain craves for some red velvet cake. Same thing with, you know, a cup of coffee, for instance, a little release of dopamine and the brain saves that. And you look forward to the next cup of coffee. That's the reason why you'll consistently see a long line of, <laughs> cars outside of Starbucks every single morning, right? It's yeah. that little release of dopamine that, you know, people seek. And even just hanging out with your friends. You go out with your friends, you have a good time, safe button again, and, you know, you look forward to such uh, experiences in the future. Now, when it comes to drugs and alcohol, uh, it's a similar thing, but this is escalated multiple fold. So with natural um, experiences come a tiny release of dopamine but when it comes to drugs for instance it's a huge release of dopamine uh, some drugs have been known to release as much as two to ten times the natural amount of dopamine that should be released in the brain so you have your brain just been flooded with dopamine because you took a hit of methamphetamine or cocaine uh, which is the reason why people very quickly become addicted to the substances the downside though is over time, this changes your brain chemistry significantly. And we're talking structurally and functionally. So you notice that over time, there's just a lot of release of dopamine. It gets to the point where there's that continual seeking for these, these drugs, which is the addiction, because you develop tolerance over time. And then with time, it just happens to be that the brain is unable to cope with that level of dopamine that you initially got from using drugs in the first place. So as the dopamine concentration decreases, which the brain is able to release, over time, people just find themselves needing to take more and more and more and more drugs to get that same level of a heat, uh, so to speak, which is the, the euphoria. And I think that is why this translates to a lot of people feeling really bored when they eventually stop using drugs because they're so used to high levels of dopamine and then you stop using the drugs and the dopamine levels are really small so that those little things that used to cause some dopamine release no longer do anything and you just feel flat and unmotivated and, and down in general. Yeah, it's my understanding that um, like your, your neuroreceptors um, 
or your brain cells have little receptors that are that are withdrawn. And That's so you, you don't even have, because your brain is trying to maintain homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, somehow like the genius of nature recognizes that this is not normal. So it does, it, it, you know, it takes away those receptors. And so more is required. And then when people get sober, like you mentioned, boredom and like lack of joy and feeling flat, those are the things that I hear about, um, as almost like a trigger for people early in recovery. It's, but what they don't realize is that it's temporary. That's right. How long, I, and this is, the, this is like the yeah. next question, how long, how long before I start feeling joy again? <laughs> that's well, you know, that's, that's a great question. And um, that's something I've looked at um, uh, in, in the past. So I've looked at quite a few studies out there, right? And in terms of how quickly the brain can recover, now there, there are studies out there, some studies for and some studies against uh, the fact that the brain can actually recover. But there are tons of studies out there that show that the brain can recover over time. The brain is capable of what we call neuroplasticity, which just means that even if areas of the brain have been damaged, the brain over time, as long as you're abstinent from illicit substances, is able to find new pathways around damaged areas and even regenerate some of the cells which were already damaged. Now, I was looking at an article from uh, John Hopkins uh, not too long ago, and it showed that for people who had used meth extensively, that over a time frame of about 14 months, that their brain was able to regenerate and get back to almost normal. And this was actually observed via brain scans from you know, normal health brains to people who had used meth from a long time and then abstained for up to 14 months. So there is the possibility of regeneration, which is the reason why the best time to stop is now because there is hope and you can actually get to the point where you're able to become fully functional again. And, you know, Alina, talking about the various areas of the brain that are affected by, by uh, drug use, we have primarily the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's responsible for cognition. So planning and decision making and scheming and calculating and thinking. Now, that is an area of the brain that is adversely affected by, um, by drugs. And what that does over time is it affects impulsivity. So people become very impulsive and end up doing things which otherwise they wouldn't have done because that portion of the brain has been damaged. And then also, we're also talking about places, a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is a part of the brain which has um, a region known as the nucleus accumbens. That is the portion of the brain that has the reward circuit. So there's a lot of dopamine release in there. And then of course, overstimulation with drugs causes an overstimulation with dopamine, which damages the reward pathways, which contributes to the boredom we, we talked about earlier on. And then of course, we're also looking at the amygdala as well, which, and, and when we talk about withdrawals from drugs, right, that is one of the central oh, areas too, right? responsible exactly for the withdrawal symptoms. So it gets to the point where the withdrawal symptoms are so uncomfortable that people just want to keep using. Now, the other portion of the brain, which I'd like to very quickly talk about is the brainstem. Now, the brainstem is not affected by a lot of drugs but it's the part of the brain that's responsible for breathing and for your heart rate. Opioids, unfortunately, affect this part of the brain. And this reminds me of, um, of um, a story which I experienced in an ER several years ago. So um, for those of you who have ever walked in an ER or have even visited an ER for that matter, you know how rowdy ERs can be. So um, I recall um, at some point several years ago as a younger physician um, attending to a uh, mental health patients in an ER, and I recall a young girl being wheeled in on a stretcher accompanied by family members. You know, um, at the time I was busy and really I'm in front ear, that's a pretty common sight, right? So I didn't really think much of it at the time. And then I carried on doing my, my work. But about 10 minutes after the girl was building, we heard a loud scream. 
there was pin drop silence in the ear. Um, this was a scream for, from a mother in agony. Mm -hmm. She had just lost her 16 year old daughter who had just been pronounced dead. Now, this was an only child who had been conceived after eight years of her mom trying to have a baby. She had overdosed on her mom's pain medications because she had been addicted to opioids. I recall at the time standing and hearing this and I had to get to sit and sit down myself because I was just so shaken to my core. I couldn't even, ima even imagine how the mom was able to take in that information and how she's even doing up till now because again, that has to leave a huge scar on a mom like that. So, you know, taking me back to the brainstem, opioids, overdosing, can get to the point where it causes respiratory depression and even death. As we can see, there's a ton of overdoses right now on opioids like heroin and fentanyl and cafentanil and other opioids out there. No, that's brutal. I, I think in 2017, it was reported there was like 70,000 deaths due to, due to opioids. And yeah, and so I'm so, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that you're coming on is because I think people need to, and family members too, need to understand what's happening because, mm -hmm. um, you know, and also they need to know like how, how they can help as well. I'm just curious though, um, you, we've been talking a lot about drugs. Does alcohol, I know that alcohol affects the frontal cortex as well. And all this, is it in all the same ways that opiates are affected? affect the prefrontal cortex? So drugs and alcohol, yes, we group, we usually will talk about this together, right? Okay. But with alcohol, you have to understand that, you know, as people drink, there's a lot of uh, a loss in inhibition. And, yeah. you know, for the most part, when it gets to that whole uh, trend and line of addiction, it's quite similar. So, okay. you know, in terms of treatment, in terms of follow up, in terms of detox, it, it's usually about the same way. Now, there are going to be variations, there are going to be differences in yeah. terms of how you treat. Um, you know, with alcohol, I think it's really important to point out the fact that, you know, um, detoxing off of alcohol can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I never advise people to try to get off of alcohol cold talking. Now, I'm really? not never? saying. No, I, I'm not because, you know, I'm not saying people haven't. Right. Some people have been able to get of alcohol cold talking without having complications like delirium tremens, yeah, seizures, DTs. DTs, precisely, you know, but there's been a lot of that associated with people trying to get off of alcohol themselves. So mm -hmm. the advice for those who drink heavily is you want to get professional help to get off of alcohol and also benzodiazepines, right? Because alcohol and benzodiazepines have similar mechanisms of action and acts in the same region of the brain, and they can potentially cause severe seizures when you try to stop them cold talking. And when you have seizures like that without any help, you could, you could potentially aspirate and people have been known to die as a result. Oh, they die from aspiration. I was thinking that maybe they would die from like brain stroke or I, I don't know. Okay, so aspiration is the end. Okay, that's really fascinating. When we, can we qualify when you say drink alcohol heavily? Like what are, what are we talking about? like uh like a bottle of di like the daily drinker right people that have become physically dependent on alcohol mm -hmm. right not the yeah. binge drinker do you yeah. feel like the binge drinker and the daily drinker are kind of two different would you take two different those are two different paths like would you you would obviously probably do the medicated assistant treatment for someone as that's physically dependent Yes. So whether you're binge drinking or you're drinking daily, I think we both agree that there's a problem right there. For sure. Um, and again, when someone comes to you to get help because they, they're drinking more than they should, then obviously something needs to be done about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think we see both ends uh, where we, I see a lot of patients who come and just binge drink as maybe once a week or once every other week and they just drink really heavily. And then of course, there's the associated blackouts and complications that come with that. So in and of itself, that's dangerous. And then, of course, we have the daily drinkers uh, who usually will start slow, right? A lot of people will probably start with a drink and then very slowly that escalates to two drinks and three drinks. And over this COVID period, right, and of course, we're doing this recording during this COVID time, 
over this COVID period, that's something I've seen so, so commonly. Um, if you look at the numbers, it's just shocking. The numbers have jumped in terms of people who are struggling, more, <clears throat> more with alcohol, in terms of people who have started drinking more heavily, in terms of people who were sober and have relapsed. So I think it's really important for us yeah. to be cognizant of that and try and do everything we can to maintain you know, living in recovery. But again, there's several reasons for that. It's, you know, <clears throat> the fact that, well, some people at home and because you're home, it's more likely that you can reach out to the refrigerator and grab a drink or grab something from the pantry while you're on a Zoom, Zoom call without your camera on. <laughs> so I'm talking to people who are telling me, well, I start out in the morning, I jump on my Zoom calls and I get the camera out, so it's just my audio, and then I have a glass of whiskey, and very quickly, by the end of the day, I realize I've had four glasses, and then I have two more glasses at night. So it's from the traditional, I drink one glass at night when I get back home from work, and more over the weekend, too, I'm now drinking six glasses a day, even as I'm working. Right. Okay. Can we talk a little bit um, about the medicated assistant treatment? I know very little about like how you would like triage someone and then um, a, like prescribe a, a treatment. Can you kind of go over that process and, and, and some guidelines maybe? Definitely. Um, with medicated assisted treatment, so it's also called MAT for short. And basically what this is, is using medication to help addiction and recovery in addition to counseling. Now, for you to proceed with medication assisted treatment, you have to have a diagnosis of a substance use uh, disorder, uh, whether it be alcohol or benzodiazepines. And as much as there are many medications out there, there are primarily three illicit substances which medication assisted treatment really help with. And these are alcohol, benzodiazepines, and opioids. Primarily. Now, uh, in terms of treatment, right, let's, let's go all the way back to detox. Uh, if you're going to start out with detox, what usually will happen is um, detox is actually done for two primary reasons. One, safety. So we talked about, you know, people dying from getting off of alcohol and benzos as a result of seizures. So safety. Uh, you want to be in a place of safety where you have professional help. Now, the advantage of being inpatient, and this can also be done outpatient in some cases, depending on the drugs, but you want to be able to have ready access to professional help where your vital signs are checked regularly when you're getting off of drugs. So your blood pressure and your pulse and your oxygen levels so that you're safe. That's one thing. And then in addition to that, it's also keeping you comfortable. Now, uh, for those who use opioids, they can attest to how uncomfortable it can be when it comes to the withdrawal symptoms of opioids. So there are various medications we can also use as well to keep you comfortable and make the process more tolerable so you're able to go through with it. Um, one thing we very commonly hear is a lot of people who try to get off of drugs on their own, they try for the first day, they're able to weather the storm, second day, they're still pushing, and by the third day, they just can because of how nasty those withdrawal symptoms are, and then they go back to using. So the advantage of detox with medications is being able to get the help you need with some medications, with monitoring your vital signs, and getting professional help to proceed. Now, following detox and maybe rehab, there's some medications that can also be used uh, to help with cravings, for instance, with alcohol. Now, with alcohol, for instance, one of the medications commonly used, right, is naltrexone. So naltrexone is a tablet which is usually given when you stop drinking, when you have detox, to help block the cravings you have for alcohol so that you end up not craving alcohol as much as you otherwise would have if you were not taking it. And what naltrexone also does for people who take it is uh, it helps you not enjoy alcohol as much as you used to enjoy it in the past. So I have some patients who are taking it and will tell me, well, you know, in the past I used to take a drink and I'll need a second and a third and a fourth. But with naltrexone, what I'm noticing now is I have one drink and I'm not really excited about having another drink. So in that sense, it actually cuts down on how much they end up drinking. Of course, we always will recommend if you have a drinking problem, the best and safest route to go is abstinence. 
That's what I'd always recommend. Um, and then other than naltrexone, we also have Vivitrol, which is actually the injectable form of naltrexone. So naltrexone is a tablet and then Vivitrol is the injection. The advantage, of, the advantage of Vivitrol is you get to give it just once a month. So as a patient, you're taking it just one time a month um, rather than having to take a pill every single month. So a lot of people find that very convenient. So you come into a clinic or a pharmacy, you have a dose for a month and then you don't bother. And then it also has higher steady state. So overall, I think I've found people do better on the injection as compared to the tablet. Just sorry to interrupt you. Just a quick question. What are, I'm curious about, I, ha, I had a, uh, a friend who was on Vivitrol and it was like she was on, uh, in slow motion. And, and I was like, this does not look like sustainable. Yes. Well, well I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. I'd, I'd like to add that these medications, right, which we use um, in medication assisted treatment and not for everybody. Now, the work for a lot of people, it doesn't mean they are silver bullets that will not work for everybody. And also, all medications have side effects. Now, with your friend, for instance, who was on, on Vivitrol, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about possible side effects with Vivitrol. Now, one of the side effects we very commonly see is fatigue, tiredness. Um, so some people just complain about feeling tired. And as a result of that, they choose not to continue with it. So that's okay. reason enough for some people to discontinue it. Um, yeah. And, and, and these are people, and so, but you are, as a professional are monitoring this person, right? And so it's not up to like, because when you're on drugs, you can't decide for yourself all the time, right? Like whether this is working or not, it's like you're on drugs. So you need the outside you need the outside perspective of a professional. That's right. uh, and, and is it is it my understanding correct that um, this is like a, tr a temporary transitional period? Like this shouldn't be forever. Like this is like to get you through the worst part. And then as you were mentioning, um, like the lifestyle component, like the wellness component and all that, like that's that's supposed to be, like they have to do all that work so that they could eventually release the the medicated assistant is that fair so so with medication assisted, assisted treatment depending on what you're going with um some people end up taking some of these medications whether it's methadone or uh, uh buprenorphine or vivitrol or naltrexone or suboxone uh, is that in the same category so suboxone is a medication we use for opioid, uh, opioid, opioid addiction okay. as well. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we use that, that as a harm reduction for opioid addiction treatment. Harm reduction. So okay. harm reduction. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, some people will take some of these medications for a few months. Now some people will take it for several years. And I'd like to say that in addition to looking at individuals on a case-to-case -case basis because everyone is different with you know different genetic bills and different um, uh, circumstances everyone is looked at different and the length the duration of taking these medications will depend on the individual and the individual's uh, circumstances mm -hmm. so some are taking it for a short time some people will need to take it for a longer time right Okay, that's fair. I, I mean, I know everyone's different. And I think that's part of the tricky part of addiction is that everybody is different. And there's lots of, you know, you mentioned that there's lots of different modalities. And, uh, but I was very curious about the whole drug assisted part. Was there more that you wanted to add? Because I know we have lots of things that we could. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah, that's right. Definitely. So, you know, we're talking very broadly about medications we can use for uh, medication assisted treatment. So, mm -hmm. detox, we're talking about detox. Yeah. You come into a detox center, the goal is one, to keep you safe, and two, to make sure you detox comfortably. Um, okay. So, it's medications to help with detox. And we also will treat symptomatically. So, if you're coming in with a lot of nausea, for instance, we can prescribe some medications to help with the nausea or vomiting, the medications for that. Some people might have a lot of diarrhea, the medications to help you with diarrhea. So it's also the symptomatic treatment. In addition to monitoring your vital signs, rehydration is also huge as well. You want to rehydrate because some of these drugs can actually cause a lot of dehydration. So it's important to get enough, enough fluids in, in you as well to make this comfortable. And then on the long term, 
if you're gonna, if you if you're struggling with alcohol, for instance, we're looking at medications like um, naltrexone and Vivitrol and Campral and Antabuse that can help you long term. Now, if you're struggling with opioids, for instance, we're looking at medications like naltrexone as well, Vivitrol, and also buprenorphine as well as methadone, which is only administered in. Um, federally regulated clinics as compared to Suboxone, which can be prescribed by most uh, primary care providers with an X number, which is a special DEA number on an outpatient um, basis. And then of course, if we're looking at nicotine, there are medications which can help with smoking cessation, whether it's uh, uh, nicotine replacement therapies, um, Zyban, which is Wellbutrin, or Chantix as well. So these are medications people can take long term to help them deal with the cravings and help them stay off of these uh, illicit substances. Yeah, no, those are all good tools. I, and, and for me personally, I sort of think of them as um, short term, um, you know, depending on the, the person, of course. I mean, I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. I, I tell people I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet, which is why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you know, Alina, you, you raise a lot of salient points. And, you know, you had, you had also talked about, you know, other modalities of treatment. I'd yeah. like to add that in addition to the medications we talk about, we, we never, we never uh, uh, propose medications as, as a silver bullet or as a magic elixir. No, we never do uh, that. It is comprehensive treatment mm -hmm. for addiction. In fact, we like to look at treatment from a biopsychosocial approach where you're looking at not just the biological components but also you know the psychological components and even cultural components as well so you know there is a lot of we, we recommend a lot of uh, wellness in addition to support in right. addition to counseling behavioral therapies to help people get through and you know even with you know, trauma, I mean, which is huge for addiction. I can't even begin to tell you how many patients I talk to on a daily basis who talk about various traumatic experiences uh, they, they've had in the past. In fact, just a few days ago, I was, I was talking to a patient who uh, gave me an account of his trauma growing up and talked about his parents breaking when he was only three years old. And he said, he, he talked about his uh, uh, his uh, mom eventually remarrying and he had a stepfather and described this vivid account where he was in his room on the stay and had a lot of screaming in the kitchen and walked into the kitchen, saw his mom uh, on the floor uh, with a stepdad standing over her with a knife threatening to kill her and talked about how traumatic and how much physical abuse there was in the family for him growing up, up to the point where he also uh, unfortunately um, got abused by his stepfather for years uh, and his mom was aware, but just because of how scared she was, couldn't do anything about it. Oh and talked about growing up as a very angry man and eventually getting into drugs and alcohol. So uh, one of the things we had to, uh, uh, to encourage him to do was, in addition to what we were doing with him in terms of medications and all, was to encourage him to get some counseling to deal with the trauma, to process that, to be able to move forward from it. What kind of counseling? I mean, I've, I've heard of things like uh, EMDR, um, EFT tapping is, it sounds like, um, I don't mean to minimize it, but uh, EMDR seems to be a really, what type of counseling addresses that severe kind of trauma childhood abuse. I mean, sexual abuse and physical abuse is, is sadly so prevalent and it affects people their entire lives. And uh, I myself have done like EMDR, which I found very helpful. I did um, mm -hmm. process therapy. I've done a couple cognitive behavioral therapy. I've tried all kinds of stuff. <laughs> such a yes. guinea pig. I love all this stuff. It's fascinating. Mostly because when, like, when I myself have gone through something like that, I get like these awarenesses or like I uh, uncover subconscious beliefs, which are very tricky to get mm -hmm. to, right? And it's like That's all. Right. It's like all these beliefs that were instilled or burned into my psyche as a child. <clears throat> it's it's very difficult to like reframe or reprogram those in adulthood. So, what kinds of counseling um, do you recommend? 
I think I think you you essentially just you know uh, listed them out, Alina. You know, um, you know, it's being able to process that trauma with a therapist who's experienced yeah. in trauma therapy. There are various uh, types of trauma focused therapy out there. You talked about CBT as well, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, where. Uh, uh, a therapist is able to help with those negative cognitions and help you make behavioral changes to adjust and move forward. EMDR is amazing. That's something I would always recommend as well. Like you talk about, you actually benefited from it. And I have seen a lot of patients uh, who benefit from uh, EMDR therapy as well. So having the therapy to process your previous uh, uh, trauma history will go a long way in helping you move forward from the addiction. Because when we talk about addiction, we have to ask ourselves why people use drugs. I don't think anybody wakes up saying, oh yes, I want to struggle with drugs and I want to have all the legal issues and all the medical complications that come with drug use. No, no one says that. But eventually people become addicted to the substances. So it's as much as you can apply yourself as much as possible to get the help you need, whether it's with medication assisted treatment, with trauma, or with just wellness in general. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, and again, I'm also really big on wellness because I think, you know, if you have struggled with drugs or alcohol, for a while, your body takes a beating. We talked about, you know, the functional and structural changes which happen in the brain. It's not just the brain. I mean, with alcohol, for instance, it affects virtually all organs in the body. It can cause damage to your liver and your kidneys and, you know, your skin. And so being able to get into a place of wellness, I think helps tremendously in terms of you becoming whole again. So when I talk about wellness, I, I'm talking about the virus tenets of lifestyle medicine. So I'm talking exercise, for instance. Now, um, the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine recommends an average of about 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. Now, this can be broken up in various ways, depending on what works for you, right? So you might decide, well, I'm going to do two days a week, or I'm going to split it up to three or five days a week. But you want to strive for about 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week, especially as related to cardio, because that's what, what really helps with the natural release of endorphins, the happy brain chemicals. Oh, cardio? Uh, so cardio releases the dopamine? Cardio, yeah. Cardio releases okay. a lot of endorphins in your brain, and that helps you uh, recover uh, uh, quite a bit. And there, there's a ton of studies out there that have shown that exercising regularly endorphins. post detox can help with your brain uh, recovery as well. What's the difference between endorphins and dopamine? Dopamine's the save button, and, and what are endorphins? So endorphins are what we like to describe as uh, the so-called happy, chem happy chemicals, the feel, <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. feel good hormones, which make you feel good. And what studies have shown is that just exercising regularly can actually help you release those chemicals that can help with stress, that can help with mild levels of anxiety and mild levels of depression, which is why when patients come to us with mild depression or mild anxiety, we're not quick to throw medications out there. Um, I usually would uh, I relate to that uh, off of um, encouraging them to just live healthier lifestyles, um, eat healthier, exercise more, talk to a counselor, and I'll only consider medications when it gets to the point where uh, the depression or anxiety is so severe that they can't uh, proceed without medications. So exercise is huge. I will recommend people as much as possible, you know, Create a regimen, and again, with exercise, it has to be something you enjoy, right? There's a reason sure. why we have a lot of gym memberships and no one's using it. Um, <laughs> I come, call that come, the fat tax. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so common, you know, because yeah. come January, right? Everybody runs up to the gym, there. and the yeah. gyms are full. And then come, you know, March, February. no one's going to <laughs> exactly, no one's going to the gyms anymore because you know there, there are stages of changes for you to be able to sustain that. Apart from the motivation to want to work out, there's also the barriers that come with it. There's also solutions to make sure you can actually continue with that and proceed with it. So, you know, with the clear, without a clear plan, motivation alone does not propel you into sustainable mm -hmm. action. In the face of adversity, very likely you're going to falter. So what you need is not just willpower, but willpower and willpower. Yeah, I feel like community is so helpful in that. Um, 
Uh, when you start making friends who were like, what if I remember I was like, okay, I need to start getting into fitness. And this was not that long ago. <laughs> I've been sober a long time, but I feel like everybody kind of has like this, uh, ebb and flow with exercise. And, and, mm -hmm. and so I was like, okay, who are all my fitness people? Like, I just need to start hanging out with them a little more. Yep. And when I started hanging out with them a little more, I started going to things like soul cycle, like those spin classes, which were super fun. And then I started going to different kinds of yoga. And so community, I just began to like develop these habits because I like, I knew that if I made a date with a friend to go to yoga, like I was 10 times more likely to actually show up because they were expecting me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I enjoyed seeing my friends. And so, yep. and it's like, I got that connection. Right. And yeah. I feel like with the pandemic and all this isolation, it shows the, it shows how being like connection is really, I call it the connection care, the community <laughs> aspect of that's recovery right. is hugely important. Um, it's huge. You know, Alina, let, let me just jump on that really quickly because that's sure. a great, great point you just raised there. You know, some things to be said for having role models, so to speak. You talk about community. You know, uh, th this reminds me of this. this the, fed, the very first commercial bungee jumping happened in 1988 in um, a place in Queenstown, New Zealand, off the Kawarau Bridge. Now, this is um, a 43 foot drop. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, right? No, and that's a hard pass for me. If that's what you're recommending, you can't be friends. <laughs> no, <laughs> not not recommending it. I'm, I'm scared of heights myself, but I me found too. that really intriguing. But the yeah. reason I find that intriguing is because, you know, you have this 43 foot drop, but there are platforms for people to watch others jump. Yeah. So a lot of people, and, and this, is a, this is a site that receives thousands of thousands of tourists every year who just go there to watch. But what happens is people go on the watching platforms and watch all the people who are bold enough <laughs> jump. And over time, they're able to vic vicariously experience that themselves because they've seen other people do it and they feel, well, okay, if these people can do it and they're safe, and they feel really good after doing it, maybe I can as well. So again, when you talk about community and support, it goes a long way. It helps tremendously. I've seen a lot of patients who have been able to get off of drinking heavily or using other drugs just because the group of friends For sure. did. So it goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. community is huge. I mean, that's... Um... In 12 step programs, you know, that's a huge component is going to meetings, you know, and, and mm -hmm. in my mind, it, you know, a lot of the neuroscience explains why the 12 step programs work, right? You, yep. you know, you you do something that's scary, right? Like you share, you're vulnerable, you're, you tell the truth, you get honest, and then you receive all this love and validation and support. And to me, I'm like, oh, that's where the dopamine reward system starts kicking in mm -hmm. your save button. I'm going to use yeah. that forever that's now. Right. That's brilliant. Um, but the save button gets triggered. Right. And so that's, and people, you know, they say, Oh, come back, please come back, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, and that's what happened to me. It's like, I, it, and I was, I've been trained. I've been conditioned that if I face my worst fears, if I get super honest and vulnerable, then I, I heal and I'm rewarded. Like it's like the two, it's two things, right? Like yeah. I actually heal because, you know, they say what you resist persist. So I face the thing that I'm resisting. I process it and it revolves, but I also get the support from the community, which sort of re helps me to rewire my brain. And mm -hmm. what you were talking about the sleep, it's my understanding that neuroplasticity happens during the sleep cycles. So, uh, and I know a lot of people really struggle early in recovery with sleep. So there's, I, I'll just throw out a recommendation. What's worked for me is uh, lots, there's all kinds of meditation apps and stuff for free. Do you have other recommendations for helping sleep? Or do you find that like the traditional meditation type stuff is the most helpful? I think, I think with meditation, you can go wrong. I will encourage anyone who can to go ahead with meditation just because of how awesome it is in terms of overall relaxing you and also helping with sleep. Now, studies have shown that people who um, uh, have struggled with alcohol and drugs uh, as much as um, have as much as five times uh, uh, insomnia as compared to people mm -hmm. uh, who haven't. So insomnia is a huge issue. 
uh, for a lot of people uh, who struggle with alcohol and drugs. And um, one of the things I, I, I see very commonly when people get off of alcohol or drugs is just struggling with sleep. Yeah. Again, you know, with self-medication, I hear, I hear a lot of people tell me, well, I drink alcohol and that helps me sleep better. Oh, yeah. Here's the thing, though, with alcohol, it may help you fall asleep, but it does not give you restful sleep. So it's usually broken sleep and you don't necessarily go into REM sleep. So you end up not um, feeling restful when you wake up in the morning and that can predispose you to more irritability and restlessness and more anxiety and, and, and depression and even impulsivity as well, which can eventually lead to relapse. So it's very, very important to tackle that. Now, there are various ways um, uh, this can be done, right? Now, one of them is diet. Um, some foods can actually make your sleep at night uh, harder. So we're talking about- Sugar. <laughs> That's right. Exactly, Alina. Sugar. So you want to avoid sugary foods, refined sugars, refined fats. And of course, you also want to avoid heavy meals at night. Now, uh, another thing is exercise. Mm -hmm. Just exercising regularly, even exercising for 15 to 30 minutes every day in the evenings can help you sleep better. But again, I want to stress that you don't want to exercise too close to when you're going to go to bed. Okay. So you definitely want to do it earlier on in the day and not as soon as you're ready to crawl into bed. And then there's light as well. Um, so if you can, depending on where you live, of course, you want to try to get some sunlight, sunlight. if possible. Okay. So sunlight helps with the release of the chemical called melatonin in your brain when it's bedtime. Oh. And then in the evenings, right, when you're indoors, if you can, you want to try and dim the lights before you go to bed. So your body begins to wind down as compared to being in really bright lights and then crawling into bed when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to electronic devices. So it's mm. your phones and your tablets and the computers. Yeah. <laughs> because these, these devices all emit blue lights, which can mm. hamper the natural release of melatonin in your brain. So again, really? you want to, yes, that's right. So you want to, as much as possible, stay away from these devices at least an hour to two hours before bedtime. Mm. And if you must use them, you're better off activating uh, the night mode. Night mode, okay. Night mode, yes. Because I was like, easier. how realistic is it that I'm going to like not scroll through Instagram one last time before I go to sleep? My In this knows. time and era, we agree. It's a hard one. But you know, if okay, you're struggling with sleep, night you need mode. to be deliberate about it. Yes, okay, night that's mode. right. And then um, again, uh, just a few other things. So bedroom temperature. Now, when you go to bed, when you're asleep, that's when your body temperature drops to its lowest. So to get comfortable sleep, we see as trials have recommended that you want the temperature to be between about 60 to 70 degrees. That's the most comfortable uh, uh, temperature to sleep. Then of course, things like noise, right? Now, if you're unfortunate and you have a lot of noise around you, whether it's just dogs barking or, or neighbors, traffic or, or neighbors, yeah. exactly. There's only so much you can do about that, right? But again, there are apps. We talked about apps earlier on. So there are yeah. apps that have the white noise, or you can get a white noise machine to drown that out a little bit yeah. to help with sleep. Okay. And then there's yeah. um, um, even bedroom color. Really? So you don't, you don't want to paint your room like a dark purple color because studies have shown that the color of your bedroom can also affect your sleep. And then there's bedtime routines. We also talk about this all the time when it comes to... I'm sorry, um, what, what's um, a good color? Room. What's a good color to paint your room? So you want to look at the lighter color. So lighter okay, green lighter colors, colors, lighter shades of, of okay. blue, lighter shades of gray. Those are more soothing to the body as compared oh, to like a dark red or okay. a dark purple color, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lighter and then, of course, there's bedtime routines. As much as you can, if you're struggling with sleep, you want to have set bedtime routines where you're going to bed at a set time and waking up at a set time as well. That helps your sleep cycle adjust. Okay. Regular yeah. routines. And then things like even just changing your mattress regularly when it's due. 
that will help. I mean, I've had some patients who've come in and said, you know, I've just had a sleep problem for a long time and I changed my mattress uh, last week and I'm sleeping so much better. But mm. these are things we take for granted and, yeah. you know, just forget as life goes on. But recall yeah. that you're spending a good seven to eight hours sleeping on your bed every day. So you want to be comfortable. These are great and then, practical um, tips. Very quickly, just a few others. Drinks. So coffee and tea, right? So coffee is a stimulant, tea is a stimulant, so this can keep you awake at night. So you don't want to drink coffee or tea shortly before you crawl into bed. In addition to these being stimulants, they're also diuretics. So diuretics are oh. substances that make you pee. So it's just going to make you use the restroom more. So if you're waking up two or three times at night to use the restroom, that's not going to help with sleep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very practical. That is so good. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to respect your time. I, I feel like we're getting a little close to our time. I also want to just um, give a little attention to how people can get a hold of you or work with you. I know you have addictionblueprint.com. Is that the best place for people to reach out to you if they have questions or need your help? Yes, I, I'm, I'm currently in private practice in Frisco, which is just that, which is a suburb of Dallas. Uh -huh. um, I have a private practice uh, called Prime Psychiatry, where I see patients. Uh -huh. um, in addition to that, I also have um, a blog called um, Addiction Blueprints, which is a place where I offer free tips and resources for people struggling with um, alcohol and drugs. I also have a Facebook group, uh, group called Inspiring Addiction Recovery. So I also offer free tips and, and, and resources uh, over there as well. And that's is called, that a private uh, group? People are typically it, like, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is a private group. Okay. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, people like to have um, a little bit of anonymity around those things. Yeah, that's right. So that's a private group. And then um, I'm also, um, we just started out a new intensive outpatient program for people struggling with alcohol and drugs and other addictions called Prime Wellness Center. And this is an intensive outpatient program where we offer recovery as well as wellness components as well to help people get better. Okay, and that's also in Frisco, Texas. Frisco, that's Texas. correct. Okay, yes, great. That's right, Alina. Oh, goodness. Well, this is such practical, useful information, right? Um, I, I really appreciate your perspective on the uh, medicated assistant treatments and the, and the need to have like a professional involved who understands like the whole, like you, it seems to me that you have the holistic picture, right? It's not just the drugs, That's it's correct. not just all the, like it, it really, there are so many factors involved in so many different modalities. I think it's so important to, you know, like when you're recovering from drugs and alcohol to have somebody who has the big picture, which you obviously do. So um, thank you so much for your time today. I will- well, thank you, uh, I leave all the links to all your things in the show notes so people don't have to try to write them down. If you're driving, don't try to text. <laughs> so, please be um, safe. Please be safe. Well, it's such a pleasure to speak with you and thanks so much for all that you're doing. It's really important work that you're doing. And so from the bottom of my heart, I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alina. I appreciate you bringing me on board. And again, I drop my hat for people like you and others as well who are doing everything we can to spread the word and also to help with the stigma that comes, uh, you know, with addiction and just to help uh, people overall. And I think we can't have enough voices, uh, regardless of the perspective. Of course, we know there are various modalities of treating addiction. I don't see one as right or wrong. I rather yeah. see them as options. And, Agreed. you know, what will work for one person might not necessarily work for another person, but just having all of these modalities and options out there, I think goes a long way in terms of helping every single person who needs the help. Agreed. Well said. Well, on that note, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day and hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. Definitely. Have a good one. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.